Our unison reading from the scripture is taken from Luke 3, 15 to 17 and 21 to 22. Let us begin. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Here ends God's holy word. I would like to invite the children to forward and we'll meet at the first pew. Okay. All right. There's a spot down here. Perfect. All right. I'm going to start where I feel a little more confident. Isa, yes. Mariah, yes. Jack, Sam, Owen, sweetheart, what's your name? Ellie. Ellie. Ellie and Eliana and Alexa and James, James and Aiden. say that again. Aiden. So, Ellie, James, Aiden. Hmm. All right. Getting, and my name is? Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Have, do you know what this is? No. It's a baptismal font. There's water in it. All right. And this is where we baptize people. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you come out in a second. Tell me, let's talk about water for a second, because we just talked about Jesus being baptized. So let's talk about water. What, um, why do we need water? What do we use water for? Jack? Drinking. drinking, right? We need water to live, right? You can only go so long without drinking water. Is water your favorite drink? Uh, no. <laughs> no. Yeah. Is it, is it, Sam, it's your favorite drink? Rock on. That's great. Um, makes, me, makes me think of my grandma Kay, who to her dying day, did not like water. <laughs> um, okay, so what else do we do with water? Mario. You forgot? Okay, Isa. You can wash clothes. That's a good thing. Yes. Swim and bake. Swim and bake? In some recipes, you just add a little bit of water. But I think it's so funny that you put those together, swim and bake. Yep, okay. But they're separate. Okay. So who, who, likes, who likes to swim? Do you, do you like putting your face in the water? No, I, I like to be Gatorade. You like what? Gatorade. Gatorade? That's your favorite drink? With, okay, with all right. Goggles, with goggles. Okay. All right, so... If you, if water, I think, is amazing, right? If you hold your breath, you can float, right? If you, um, but you can also swim underneath it. Um, the, well, I'll, I'll ask the adults. We can turn around. Anybody scuba dive? There's a few, right? Isn't it the best? Then you don't even have to worry about floating, right? You can just go under, and it's just, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's a beautiful um, it's one of my favorite things. When I was your age, I did not float very well, right? So, 
right? So I was always working really, really hard to, to stay afloat, treading water, right? And then when scuba, you don't have to worry about that. Whoop, it's beautiful, right? So we talked about washing clothes. What about, do you ever use water to, I don't know, Sam, take a shower or a bath, right, to, to clean, right? So we also use water in worship for, for baptism, and it means a lot of different things, and I'm not going to go over everything that it means, but, and different traditions do it differently. But one of the things that, um, you know, uh, that we remember in, in baptism and it's, is, is that we are, we are made clean. Yes, Owen. Say the first part again. The boat. Boats float on the water? Yeah. Yes, that is true. Yeah, you can travel on water too. Very good. Um, all right, so, but when it, the passage that we just read, Jesus is in the water. He's, he's being baptized. And this voice from heaven says, you are my son, my beloved, and you, in you I am well pleased. When, and, I, and I know that not everybody has been baptized but we actually are already, when we do baptize, we're already saying something out loud that is already true. That God loves us. That would, that's what it means to be beloved. To, that God loves us. That we belong to God. And that God is with us. God loves us. We belong to God. And God is always with us. Right, and so when we baptize somebody in the church, we also remember our own baptism. And before everybody leaves the sanctuary later, I'm going to encourage people to come forward, and they can dip their fingers in the water and make a sign of the cross on their forehead. And the cross is when we think of of, as Jesus, right? Um, But this is a way to remember for us to remember that we. what, What did I say? We are loved. We belong to God, and God is always with us. Can you? Can you say, what did I just say? Three things. We are loved. We belong to, and God, God is always with us. Okay, we're good. I'm good. All right, so you want to gather around here? Do you want to dip your fingers in the water? Do you feel it? Okay. Okay. Do, do you know in some traditions the the pastor or the priest will dip an evergreen branch, which means there are trees called evergreens that are green all year round. That's why they call them evergreen. And then then they will do this at the at the congregation to remind them of their baptisms. Right? Okay. All right. Very good. Shall we say a prayer? Did everybody? Did you dip your fingers? Did you want to dip your fingers? Okay. Let's say let's sit and we'll say a prayer. Let's. We're gonna fold our hands. Close our eyes, bow our heads. Dear God, we thank you that we know that we are loved, that we belong to you, you call us your own, and that you are always with us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So our second scripture lesson comes from the same writer of Luke for the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, so the very beginning. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over the course of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father, This, he said, is what you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know how I write down fabulous things that people say? 
So this week at the Montclair Interfaith Clergy Association meeting, a Quaker friend said, we don't know how to do it, but we're doing it. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can resonate with that. That's ministry these days. We don't know how to do it, but we're doing it. Have you ever been put in charge of something that you felt ill-equipped to do? Maybe your first job? I don't know, maybe when they handed you that baby when you were ready to leave the hospital for the first time. (laughs) Or maybe when the pastoral leadership of the church, who have been here for years and years and years, all retire, and they've kind of set the direction, and then the transitional pastor comes in and asks, you know, who are you, and how do you feel that God has called you into ministry moving forward? And you're like, oh, Emotionally, I think you can connect, or we can connect with the disciples, the apostles, who are sent out as they watch, and Jesus leaves again, thinking, wait, what, you're, hold on a second, you're leaving again, and, and what, you want us to do what? Let's uh, remember again who the disciples were. Last week, we read, and it was underscored, underlined, highlighted by the writer of Luke, that or by of Luke and Acts that Peter and John were uneducated men. So the disciples, the apostles, were not the you know the best and the brightest. They didn't show the most potential. You know, they, I, my joke is these were the Hebrew school Hebrew, Hebrew school dropouts. These were the men and women, and I do want to. Women were there too, and I. I don't know when it hit me how absolutely amazing when we talk about uh, women being included in the ministry of Jesus. The, the, the story of Mary and Martha, you know, are you a Mary, are you a Martha, are you a both, are we both need both. The fact that Jesus was teaching a woman, that a rabbi had a woman sitting at his feet, that he was teaching her is absolutely radical. He called women. So, Here's this group of, of, of folks who were not the most scholarly, not the most educated. And I imagine them going home to their parents to say, you know, that, hey, a rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, has asked me to be a, a disciple. And I picture a mother saying, does he know how you did in school? Does Does he know what your grades were? Does he know how much gray hair I got trying to get you to study? And then the father asking, did he ask for money? Because if he asked for money, and and, then the person, no, 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 no. He is a real deal. You need to come and see for yourself. The disciples listened, learned, were sent out, witnessed miracles, were part of miracles, and now they're told that they're going to do even greater things than Jesus. The Spirit of God will empower you. Wait here, the Spirit will come. And can you see them looking at each other, questioning, wondering, taking a deep breath, and collectively saying, Lord, help when we're asked to do things that feel beyond us, that's where we find ourselves, crying out to God, Lord, have mercy. And I, and I wonder if that isn't why these simple ones were chosen, because they know that they needed God, because they didn't think too much of themselves, versus the people who think very highly of themselves, who have been very successful in this world, who are very busy doing very important things, You want us to do what? With whom? And we can do that in the church, too. You know, the church can give side eye. Do you remember the the skit, Dana Carvey, and he'd do that, the church lady voice? You know, isn't that special? Right? We can do that. I do it much sweeter, though. Oh, isn't that special? Jesus chooses special people. Jesus redeems the least of these, and Jesus asks us all to follow. We all have different levels of success in this world. 
But imagine yourself standing with the disciples. The fate of the church of Jesus Christ now rests squarely on your, on your shoulders. Are you panicked? So let me remind you of something. The Holy Spirit will be with you. You are baptized with the Spirit. You are beloved by God. God is with us. The language of you in the Gospel of, of Luke in Jesus' baptism is unique to this Gospel. At Jesus' baptism, we hear God say, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. God says that to each of us in our baptisms. And by the way, this appears to be a mashup of Psalm 2, verse 7, and Isaiah 42, verse 1. Psalm 2, verse 7 is, I will tell you the, de the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And Isaiah, here is my servant who, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Psalm 2 was, in the Jewish tradition, was used at the coronation of a new monarch. So whether you knew your Old Testament or not, God was claiming Jesus as beloved. And there's a lot of confusion as to why Jesus was baptized. If baptism is about forgiveness, then why would Jesus need to be forgiven because we, we think of him as sinless? Now, here's the thing. It's not just about forgiveness. Baptism is about God's love for us. God's love is not contingent about forgiveness. Forgiveness comes because of God's love for us first. And as you probably know, there are different understandings of baptism. There's believer's baptism, which is adult baptism, which we, the emphasis is on repentance, versus infant baptism, where the emphasis is on God's covenant, that God, love, and forgiveness comes to us before we can do anything to mess up. My first church was an interdenominational church in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And the other pastor that I worked with was American Baptist. And as Baptist, you would uh, baptize people as adults. And occasionally somebody would come forward and say, I want to be rebaptized. And he would go, Yes. And I'd be like, Wait. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And, you know, can I at least have a shot to try to convince them that they don't need to be rebaptized? That, you know, once, once is good for all, and what they, what they want to do is to have a confession of faith, which we can do in worship. But try to convince people when the prospect is to go get rebaptized in the, in the Caribbean Sea, right, and under a bright sun, and, and we say, or you could stand up and worship, and, and you know, I never won, I never won. And, and the other pastor, Randy, was in his glory in it fully robed in the ocean, baptizing people, and I got to be the towel girl on, on, the, on the shore. You know, here, big hug. Yeah. The disciples standing in Jerusalem, waiting, with time to dwell on the fear, to wrestle with their sense of inadequacy, to question the wisdom of God in choosing them. On them, the Holy Spirit rested, and they embraced their mission knowing that the power of God was with them. How aware are you of your inadequacies? If you are, that's not a bad thing. Then you'll know how to pray, to seek God, and to rely on God, to lean into God. Lord, I can't do this without you. Are you feeling lost? Then wait for the Holy Spirit to reveal to you where you should go, what you should do. But remember to pray, to seek God, and to rely on God. We are in a process of discerning where God is leading. We trust that the Holy Spirit is in our midst to reveal, to show, to guide. Are you feeling overwhelmed? Remember that the same word for spirit is breath. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again, that the, when God reveals God's name to Moses... We have four consonants that we're not sure how it should be pronounced. One guess is Jehovah, another guess is Yahweh. Some believe that it might not be able to be pronounced, but really sounds like the sound of our breath. <sighs> that when you suck in air, like, <sighs> because you're startled, or when you find yourself sighing, like, <sighs> 
we are calling on the name of God. Isn't that beautiful? We are calling on the name of God. What is the big thing that you're facing? Is it being a parent? Is it being on your own for the first time in a long time? Caregiving? Stress at work? Marital strife? Worry? Depression? Illness? The future of the church? In your struggle, ask for God's help. Remember to pray, and it really makes all the difference in the world. God wants to be with us in the trenches. God wants to show us that God is and that God is with us. A couple stories. Uh, when I was first starting out in ministry, I had a parishioner that I, I was struggling with. And, you know, it's always the stuff that, that you don't like about yourself that bother you and other people. You know, and you get to the point where you're, you're like, darn, you know, is that true? Yes, it is true. And then you have to deal with all that stuff, which is not what, which you've done. We've done no fun. But I, there, this woman, I was really challenged with her and I talked with my mom, I called her and I was telling her about this challenge and she said, pray for her, start praying for her and let God do God's thing. I don't think I'm paraphrasing you, mom. I'm sure you didn't say it that way, but, and not too long after, I'm talking with this woman, and she told me her story. And, and apparently, I, the, the challenge was some people who complain all the time. And so I must work on that on myself, not to be a complainer, not to be a whiner, not to be. And then when she told me her story, I was like, oh, my. And I didn't have another problem. I got it. And I was like, ooh, answer to prayer. So... Spiritual tip, if you have a challenge by somebody, start praying for them, and God will open the door for you to have some understanding so that suddenly you are praying for them and loving them in a spirit of love and not of, oh, Lord, have mercy. Another story. Different church. Somebody was stealing from the church. I knew it. Had no proof. But I prayed on it. I read scripture, and I came to the conclusion that I was supposed to confront that person. So I went to bed saying, okay, Lord, that's what I'm going to do. I woke up in the middle of the night with a nightmare that that's what I had done. I confronted the person. It blew up. It was awful. And I immediately just looked to the heavens and said, okay, I got it. I won't do it. And then in the morning said, but you, I don't know what to do, Lord. I, know, I don't know what to do. You have to fix it. Within a month, I had proof. And I, we worship the living God who wants to be in the trenches with us, who wants to show us that God is. The Holy Spirit is alive and well. Hear these words in the name of Jesus. I say to you, you are mine. You are mine. You are loved. I am with you. I would invite you when you leave the sanctuary to come dip your fingers in the font, make the sign of the cross on your forehead to remind yourself that God loves you, you are claimed, you are beloved, and that God is with you. I, there are some people who keep a little bowl of water by the door of their home, and when they walk out of the door, before, or at, before they walk out every morning, they do that. Oh, my gosh. What a beautiful symbol and way to enter the world. God goes with me. God goes with us. There are the challenges in life that touch us all, and there is the call of Christ to witness to those experiences, the experience of, of God that all might know that we are loved and claimed by God. That is, that is our, in, in, at the end of the day, that is our job. That's our call, to let the world know that God is, that God is with, that God wants to be in the trenches with us. It is absolutely terrifying that God would rely on, forgive me, but this group of misfits, with the fate of the church, ever so aware of our inadequacies, ever dependent on the Spirit of God, 
but it's because we're aware of our inadequacies and because we rely on the spirit of God that God is glorified in us and the church of Jesus Christ is alive and well. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. You are loved. You belong to God. God is with us. In Jesus' name, amen.